Hey there, everyone. Today on The Final Bar, a choppy session for stocks, but the S&P 500 manages to close back above its 200-day moving average. Defensive, defensive sectors, that is, on the rise with utilities at the top of today's leaderboard. Tom Atkinson of FX Evolution will be joining us live from Melbourne, Australia. Which charts are standing out in his process? Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a cloudy Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after, we, uh, after the market closes. We break down the market action using technical analysis. I have always argued that technical analysis is a very practical toolkit. I remember when I was teaching technical analysis uh, at Brandeis University outside of Boston for second year master's students. And they came to me, I feel like after a year and a half of very theoretical, very textbook oriented analysis and analytical methods uh, for what the markets should be like based on sort of the theory uh, of the day. I came with a very practical set of discussions. We would look at Apple or Nvidia or Intel or Verizon or whatever stock we were trading that particular day and we would bring it and look at it together and talk about what patterns we saw and what signals, what triggers compelled us to take action or think about risk versus potential return. And so technical analysis, if you're trying to make sense of a market in uncertain times, if you're trying to get your head around what's happening, what's working and what's not, I would be hard pressed to find a better set of tools than the technical toolkit. And really having a disciplined process of charts and hopefully the final bar can be part of that discipline process for you. Hopefully you can have more consistent, more effective uh, analysis and more effective and more uh, constructive returns over time. With that in mind, let's go to our market recap and talk about what happened in the markets today. Sort of a choppy, noisy session. We'll get to the chart in a minute. Before we do it, I want to ask you a uh, poll question. We asked all of our subscribers recently, where is the S&P 500 one month from today? 10% up, 10% down, somewhere in the middle. And I love asking these questions, and I tell you why. If you notice, you can't say zero, you can't say neutral. And what I found is if you say up, down, or sideways, there's a lot of sideways in any sort of a, a polling question. But if I force you into a little positive or a lot positive, a little negative or a lot negative, then you have to at least at some level make that binary choice. Do I see the S&P as higher or lower one month from today? Now, what's interesting about that question right now is we're hitting a very important seasonal time for stocks, right? The S&P 500 often has had a major bottom in September, certainly into October. Uh, most of the time, the fourth quarter has been particularly strong. November and December, some of the strongest months out of the 12, if you look at the average year. So we may be setting up for an interesting uh, market bottom. I don't know if I've seen enough of those conditions telling me it's happened today, but what did we, uh, what did we come up with? 38% said between zero and 10% higher. A quarter of you said at least 10% higher. What's interesting about that that would put us, what, 40, 4,700? That's a pretty decent rally uh, for, the, uh, for the next month for the uh, S&P 500. I would probably go zero to 10% lower, uh, but we'll, uh, let's look at the charts and, uh, and the market today and see what the evidence, uh, how it plays out for us. Looking at the market today, the S&P 500 up three quarters of a percent, just below 4,250. And what's interesting about that is that's taking us back above the 200-day moving average. We closed below there on Friday session. Yesterday kind of traded around it today, traded below, but then back above. So I would argue still in play that very important line. And that moving average is one that many follow. Even investors that are not particularly technically oriented, they happen to know where the 200-day moving average is. And I will tell you that from experience being on buy side trading desks of major investment firms, the traders there that are actually putting uh, you know, the, the big trades into practice over a period of hours or days or weeks, they all seem to know where the 200-day was always. So that's an important level. For now, we remain above there. The Nasdaq Composite finishing up about 0.9%. Mid caps and small caps all up as well, lagging a little bit behind the S&P large cap index. The uh, VIX pushing back below 20, and I think that could be pretty important. Last week, we talked about this increase in volatility. The VIX tends to be known as the fear gauge, the uncertainty gauge. You certainly saw an increase in volatility. You saw an increase in the move index, which is the volatility for bonds. Uh, those sorts of things tend to be more similar or more consistent for bear market phases than bull market phases. The VIX coming back below 20. This might be an important thing uh, to watch because one of those back of the envelope sort of measures, VIX above 20, uh, volatile environment or high volatility, VIX below 20, more low volatility. 
the biggest advances in stock market history have tended to come, at least in the modern area, on lower volatility. And the drops, the, the, uh, the, the pullbacks, the drawdown phases is where you tend to have a spike in volatility. So for now, coming off a bit, still pretty elevated relative to where we've been here uh, over the last year or so. Looking at the bond markets, it ended up netting up to a kind of a quieter day after some significant movements recently. The long end came down uh, a little bit, but overall, the 10-year, 5-year points, not too much different from yesterday's close. The TLT, which has been, you know, certainly an important downtrend out of, uh, out of many, but, you know, something that's just been in a consistent sell-off mode for quite some time, rebounding to the upside a little bit, about 1.3% higher for the TLT. And the dollar ETF, the UUP, was up about 0.6% from uh, yesterday's close. Looking at the commodity space, a little bit of mixed results, but more red than green here. The DBC, which is a broad commodity ETF, finishing up 1.1%. Gold and silver, not too much different uh, from yesterday's close. Crude oil prices coming off a bit, uh, and that's certainly something uh, to watch. You know, there's been a lot of speculation, a lot of debate about what crude oil prices do given a, a further escalation in the Middle East. Obviously, this is a big unknown. We can look at historical parallels. And if there is a you know, challenge to the supply of crude oil, you'd certainly expect that uh, that could be a, a spike higher in crude oil prices. I've heard speculation the crude oil goes to 100, 120, even 150 was a target I heard last week as people were talking about potential outcomes. That is still very much a question mark. For now, energy stocks, energy prices coming off a bit. Finally, cryptocurrencies, particularly the most important ones, ones like Bitcoin and Ethereum, continuing to push to the upside. I was actually chatting with uh, Adrian Zadunchik of CryptoBurb. He's uh, uh, been uh, a guest on the show, we actually talked. Hopefully, we can get him on here very soon. We were talking about some of the seasonality. What he had shared with me was some work that they had done that shows that October into November, December, actually seasonally for uh, Bitcoin, actually incredibly strong. So it's, it's actually following the seasonal tendencies uh, so far in uh, in the month of October, uh, but Bitcoin currently just below thirty four thousand. Let's look at the eleven S and P sectors. You can see almost all of them finishing uh, in the positive. Energy, the only outlier, finishing down on the day one point four percent. Healthcare and financials, also technology, sort of lagging behind the overall market return. The top of the list, pretty defensive. So before you get all bulled up based on today's price action, before you think this was a big check in the bullish column. It's utilities, maybe the most defensive of all, number one, and REITs, one of those other pretty defensive sectors at the, uh, the second spot. So, you know, 2.6% higher for uh, utilities, real estate, materials, uh, communication services, that, uh, that is all up about 1.2% for the day. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500, just see how today fits into this overall um, uh, trend that we've been talking about I mean, there's no doubt, I think, you know, I always like to start with what is your initial reaction, that basic Charles Dow, are we in an uptrend or are we in a downtrend? And I, when I teach people how to do technical analysis from scratch, we start building a checklist. And the very first thing always on my checklist is the Dow theory question, is the chart going up or down? And I do that, the way I make that basic assessment is just by looking at the highs and the lows. Are we making higher highs or lower highs? Are we making higher lows? or lower lows. And if you look at the S&P 500, if you look at a lot of individual stocks as well, by the way, we're in a pattern of lower highs and lower lows, which is the basic downtrend. Last, uh, over the last week, we've made another new swing low, undercutting the low from uh, the first week in October. So we had the bounce higher to a descending 50-day moving average where we failed, and now the S&P making a new swing low. Now what's happened is we're kind of getting caught up in this area of support. And I will tell you uh, over, you know, in my experience, I tend to think of support levels not as absolute levels. I think if you imply that the S&P hits 4204 spot 38 and that's the level, I think that is, uh, that is a little tone deaf to the reality of market conditions in 2023. Supply and demand is pretty fluid. There are trades happening in a lot of different places. Something like the S&P is aggregating millions of trades from lots of different places around the world. So thinking of a particular decimal point as a level I think is pretty unreasonable. Thinking of them as support and resistance ranges, I think super powerful. And that's why I would say that sort of this 4180 to 4220 range, which was basically where we've been for the last three days, we kind of hit there on Friday session, yesterday, today, sort of still trading around these levels. That comprises the 200 day moving average, that 4200 level, which has served as resistance before, and uh, the first Fibonacci uh, support level around 4180. So we're at what's called a confluence of support. 
I would be more surprised if we traded right through this than if we have the experience we, we are now, which is basically we are finding support. There's a reasonable expectation that you get at least a brief bounce off of that support level, just as we did in, uh, in early October. And the question is if and when we violate to the downside. And when we do, on that episode of the show, I will immediately start talking about some further downside objectives. For now, I'm waiting to see if that 4180 to 4220 uh, range will uh, hold. For now, it is. But there's a lot of game left, as they say, and a heavy earnings week. Today, by the way, after the close, we have Microsoft, we have Alphabet, we just had Spotify. There's a lot of market cap represented in earnings this week, last week, the week to come. So certainly some potential catalyst to move the market very quickly one way or, uh, or the other. I just want to briefly touch on the chart of Bitcoin. We dug into this a little bit yesterday. We also talked about Ethereum prices, so I don't want to beat it too much further, but just to point out that Bitcoin continues to go higher. As I mentioned, I was chatting with uh, Adrian Zdunczyk, uh, and, and we were talking about just this renewed strength that we've seen. What, what strikes me is a couple things. Number one, how different the chart of Bitcoin is starting to look from the chart of the S&P 500. Now, there have been times when it, these uh, two assets have felt very highly correlated, right? Stocks and cryptos moving together. That is not the case we're seeing right now. You're seeing very much a vote of uh, optimism uh, with uh, Bitcoin powering above 31,000 yesterday, continuing to push higher. It actually touched uh, just over 35K earlier, uh, earlier today. Also, the second observation, extremely overbought. So we have an, uh, an RSI above 80. And in my general, uh, my general take on that is that's what we would call the good overbought, right? If something's just briefly overbought and comes down, that often tells you where we've exceeded sort of the normal range and you'd expect a brief pullback. When something becomes extremely overbought with an RSI of 80 plus, that usually doesn't mean the very end. Now it's happened, but it's a lot more common that you get a pullback and then an, at least one more further move to the upside. And so I think that's what is setting up sort of the bullish longer term argument for Bitcoin is the fact we're actually getting up to these levels. Look back in January of 2023, that example where Bitcoin kind of went vertical, we became extremely overbought. We came back a little bit and certainly had some drawdowns, but overall, the weight of evidence remained positive. The momentum remained positive and, and on pullbacks, Look to see if the RSI can hold 40. That's another uh, sort of key level to, uh, to watch. You know, one of the things that we used to do a lot on the show, and I got away from it, and to be honest with you, I don't remember making this particular decision, but I certainly did. You know, we used to look at this uh, candle glance page for the S&P sectors, and I just wanted to bring that up because as I was looking at utilities and REITs at the top of the list, I'm, you know, wanting to take a step back and just think about the overall configuration. So, this is looking at the 11 S&P sectors and then the S&P 500 itself. I'm using the SPY here in the lower right. This is using the sector spiders uh, for each of these. And, you know, general observations to make. Number one, how many of these sectors are above both their 50-day and 200-day moving averages? Take a moment and look around the screen, and I will quickly point you to only one that fulfills that criteria as of today, and it's in the upper left corner, communication services. With all of these other sectors struggling to hold support, many of them making new lows again in October, communication services a clear outlier. And you see that from the RRG. You see the strength in communication services as others have sort of come in and out of favor. The XLC has sort of remained in a position of strength. Charts like Alphabet, Meta, some of the stronger names in the markets, but certainly in the Magnificent Seven. Those are the ones I'd probably put at the top of the list in terms of uh, trend characteristics right now. So the XLC is certainly an outlier in that it's actually testing new highs uh, even in October, right, as others are uh, struggling. Which of the sectors are below two downward sloping moving averages, meaning not only are they making new lows, but the overall trend has gotten worse and worse. Let's start and see how many we can find. Uh, consumer staples, certainly below two downward sloping, the 50 and the 200 day. Financials, Still below there, the 200-day uh, sort of gently going lower. Healthcare, industrials, maybe. Uh, the 200-day is kind of flat there, so I don't know if I would uh, consider that. Materials, not as much either. It's kind of the 200-day still kind of uh, flat. Utilities, real estate. So when you think about those sectors that I just mentioned, staples, utilities, real estate, healthcare, these are basically the more defensive side of the, uh, of the market. Now, if you look, utilities has made quite a counter trend move. It's now making arguably a higher low and rotating higher. The utility sector is an important one, and a lot has been, uh, has been uh, studied and discussed about uh, the value of watching utilities. There are times when utilities do well in a bull market phase, but 
more often uh, than not, utilities are a defensive play, right? As an institutional investor, you only really want to own something like utilities when you don't want to own other things. It's basically to get away from other risk assets that you might be on or other risky bets. So an improvement in utilities, a higher low and a continued improvement uh, would certainly, I think, be one of those uh, one of those things that would tell me to be a little bit more broadly defensive. Staples, again, still going down. In the short term, rallying, but overall, the trend is still down. So I think those defensive sectors still have quite a bit to, pr uh, to prove more on the medium term time frame to suggest a broader rotation to uh, signs of strength. Just to finish off here, let's talk about a couple uh, earnings names. Uh, and first, I want to get to uh, LVS, the gambling uh, group. When I'm looking for signs of optimism. And what I mean are things that are starting to not go down when it feels like everything else is going down. Las Vegas Sands is a chart we've talked about off and on. I might actually have one of them saved here. But we highlighted uh, LVS as what's called a, no, I don't have a good example here. We highlighted it as what's called a um, uh, complex head and shoulders pattern, which is basically where you have this clear sort of uh, a topping pattern, a high surrounded by lower highs. But look how there are multiple left shoulders, multiple right shoulders, one head. That's what's called a complex head and shoulders pattern. Just the whole pattern kind of widens out a little bit. The interpretation is kind of the same. You have a neckline, and you're looking for when that neckline is broken. It was broken in August when we also broke down through the 200-day moving average. Look how it retested that neckline and also the 200-day from below and then failed. So it was literally, I, future textbooks about chart patterns should feature this chart. It's a great illustration of why you look at topping patterns and how to actually follow through and see that natural progression. Now, the way that you would identify or anticipate a potential downside target is you do this. You basically take the height of the pattern. I'm doing the very quick version just for uh, simplicity, about a 19, 20% drop from the top of the head to the neckline. You subtract that from the, uh, the, the breakdown, which was the neckline there, and that gives you a downside objective. And look at where LVS has sort of bottomed out, right around $44 a share. So what strikes me is what a beautifully uh, classic pattern this is, the simplicity of the breakdown, the follow through, the retest. Now we've reached that minimum downside objective, and now we've started to rotate higher. So while the fact that we're starting to stop making new lows and start to make a new swing high, maybe regaining the 50-day, also from that measurement off of the pattern, it's suggesting a bit of a bottom uh, there as well. It makes me think of the S&P chart also having uh, a bit of a head and shoulders top. Uh, we have not quite reached that downside objective for the S&P, by the way. Other stocks in this group, kind of similar uh, you know, potential patterns. Win, not as attractive, and I would say with with Wynn, with uh, MGM, for example, these are stocks kind of still in a, uh, in a downtrend. I think Wynn is an interesting one to watch because we've been below a descending 50-day moving average here. We've retested it a number of times. Charts like this, I, this is never an easy game that we're playing, but charts like this below a downward sloping 50-day moving average and looking for a break above can be a really simple way of just trying, starting to identify the chart has been going down and now it's not going down anymore. That's it for our market recap today. I do want to bring on today's guest, Tom Atkinson. Before I do so, a couple quick announcements. First off, we welcome your questions. We had a great live Q&A on yesterday's show on Monday. The chat is open now, so during the show, feel free to drop a question in there anytime. Some of our episodes, we won't be able to get to live questions, but we will always capture those and put them in the mailbag. We'll do a mailbag segment on Friday's show, and we'd love to hear from you and answer uh, one of your questions on the air. If uh, that's not what you can do, put a comment below the video uh, that you're watching on our YouTube channel. That's another way to get your questions to us. Or email, always a great way, thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. Again, we'd love to hear from you and uh, hope to answer your question in our next mailbag show, which will be Friday's show of this week. I want to welcome on today's guest, Tom Atkinson. Tom's the chief technical analyst at FX Evolution. Very kindly waking up early to join us live from Melbourne, Australia. I was able to meet Tom and uh, Tyrone and others from the FX Evolution team in Las Vegas at their fantastic conference uh, recently. Tom, it's great to see you again. How are you today? Yeah, I'm really good. It's it's earnings week. And of course, Microsoft and Google just coming out. Very exciting stuff. So you've got to be up early here in Australia, but we're trading the best market in the world. So <laughs> what can you do? <laughs> I feel like there are times, and, and I, again, you put out a lot of content as well covering, covering the markets. And I feel like there are times when it's hard maybe to find 
ideas of what to talk about. This is not one of those times. Uh, packing as much as we can into a short daily show is a, a challenge on its own. You brought some charts with you using the, the Stock Charts ACP platform. I want to get to those. We're starting with your chart of, uh, of the S&P, but really thinking about the yield curve. Uh, obviously, it's top of mind with the Fed meeting coming up uh, next week. Start us here and talk us through what you're seeing. Yeah, so this is a really interesting chart. So obviously, we all talk about recessions, and that's been the discussion point of what I feel like a year and a half now. Uh, however, it's not really, we usually never see a recession until uh, we see US 2 and 10-year yields uninvert. So that is, they go back uh, be below basically the 1% or you see here it goes above that, that zone down there. So until that happens, we don't tend to actually see a recession getting called or even about to happen. Uh, we just had a GDP number that looks obviously impressive for the US. So what we're seeing here is we're seeing a uninversion of yield about to occur. And I suggest this is a chart that we should all have running on our platforms. And the reason why is because what happens and what tends to happen with these vertical lines is we usually see a run up actually when this uninversion happens. So markets actually recover. Now that would make sense to the seasonal period that we're in as well, Dave, which you know well, which is that of course, October, November, December, pre-election year kind of what we call bull rally that tends to happen. And it actually usually turns to low about a day ago, <laughs> statistically. Right. So uh, here is the uh, uninversion chart. I, I think it's really good. But what happens after is, is probably the worrying sign. We usually are around four to six months away from a recession technically being called at that stage. And then sometimes we get a bit of a brutal market. So I don't expect 2024 to be anything other than up, down and all around. But I am kind of like looking at this chart very, very closely because it's the signs of recovery into a potential drop in the future that we should be looking for. A uh, great reminder of just using some of these, I mean, simple visualizations just to show the yield curve, the shape of it, how that relates to mm -hmm. some of the other data that we could uh, we could consider. Talk to me a little bit about transports. This has been an area of the market that certainly started to break down among others. What does this tell you about the conditions mm. here? Yeah, so it's often considered a lead indicator along with home builders. Uh, home builders also looking terrible on charts. So again, should have that one there. We've seen a trend line break, which is that uh, recent kind of red line that's going through. And I've got a level down here with the horizontal line that's what we call the most traded level. So effectively down the bottom there, it could be where we start to see buying pre uh, buying support for the transportation average, but this can often be an indicator of further weakness in markets coming through. So even if we get recovery, if this isn't recovering, then we may not be able to trust the recovery overall. Watch home builders and watch Dow, Dow Jones transportation average. Very important to have them coming with you. Mm, yeah, it's hard to feel too confident about the markets with home builders and transports looking how they are. And you're certainly seeing a yeah. continued downtrend there. Equal weighted S&P. We talk a lot about market breadth. And I know when I presented with uh, at your, again, well done conference in, uh, in Las Vegas, we talked a little bit about breadth conditions and what they mean. What do you see from breadth here in October of 23? Now or never, yeah, Dave. <laughs> this is this is a big this is a big component. Uh, again, trend line, red line. Uh, we can see that above. We're in what we call the demand zone, so very important that that equal weight starts to see some recovery here. But really, it's about those squiggly lines down the bottom. The percentage of stocks above the twenty, which is the first one, above the fifty, which is the second one, and above the two hundred. These have all so shown an uptick over the last two trading sessions, which is a good sign. Uh, but we really need these to start to turn. Now, as a contrarian, you would say that fear started to hit the market. If we look at all of those, especially things such as the 50 and the 20, they've come underneath uh, the 30 and the 20 respectively. And those levels historically have actually been pretty good. Let's call it buy the dip zones, although we don't like using that word. Uh, mm. and, and this is this is like one of those signs where if you're a contrarian, you like this area and you say, I've been patient and waited. But uh, yeah, if it gets worse and we start to break under that green box, we've got problems, Dave, I'd say. Mm. And a, a brilliant trend line, bright red trend line tracking the highs, just a fairly consistent sell-off. We're seeing that mm. in other places as well. This is going to be a, a theme to some of these charts, I think. It Compare is. that now yeah. to the chart of the S&P 500. And again, overall sense of where we're at here. Yeah, I think at the conference, I really resonated with you. It was funny. We had a question. It was, what was your most important zone on the S&P? And I think you and I answered the exact same level, which was pretty funny, <laughs> which right. I think was actually 4150 or something like that. Yeah, that's uh, right. Now, 4150 right. just so happens, 4150, 4120 just so happens to be the most traded level of literally pretty much this entire 
let's say 18 months. Um, so we know that funds have positioned in. We can assume that the funds probably positioned towards long side because, of course, in that green box there, they push towards the bullish uh, after that and they created that squeeze. But this zone, if we do end up hitting it, it's going to be such an important one for the bulls to hold. Positionals will have to come in. We were looking for wicks around that zone. We're looking for strength coming back into the market. But we don't always get the level we want, yeah, Dave? So this is the zone. 4200 is also very important. We always liked we like to create like an area. And I think what we've seen in the last 24 hours, and especially just with Microsoft results coming out, looking quite good, Google obviously a bit, bit subpar, maybe we're seeing a little bit of strength coming back into this market. So this is where with that red arrow, we've got that, that long leg doji. We're looking for a closure above tomorrow, above the doji to kind of say, okay, we're ready to move up. And as you said, the common theme here is if you really want to be a conf confirmation bull, we need to take that trend line and take that red box above. And once you do that, good times. <laughs> well, well said, well said. Apple, and again, I, I think one of the biggest challenges of the market now for every alphabet sort of in this continued uptrend, there are a bunch of apples and many, many others kind of pounding out lower highs and lower lows. When you look at the chart of Apple, signs for optimism or questionable in your mind? Uh, look, I like I've liked these levels for the last two sessions. Um, so I, I think that Apple is is there's a Fibonacci there on that chart, and obviously mm -hmm. a trend line. But we'll we'll get to the that in a second. I think with the S and P, what it did the last twenty four hours in particular was showing us that there are buyers coming back in. We saw massive dark pool transactions across the board that were coming in right at those lows. That usually shows a little bit of bullishness. The thing was they they were all almost in leveraged ETFs. So when we see that, it often can be short-lived and that's what we've got to be most careful of. Apple here, 618786 kind of fib pullback after taking that previous high at 180. That's big. Uh, again, if you want to be more of a swing trader, we're looking for markets to move above that trend line. And that trend line is going to be the exact same trend line we're seeing on the queues as well. So if we had a chart here of the NASDAQ, there's literally a trend line on the S&P. There's a trend line on the uh, queues, there's a trend line on Apple. And what that's telling us that we can't really be sure the rally is real until we break through there. But I think there's positive signs here on the markets for the short term. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, and, and, and I often talk about what I call a change of character. Are you getting that sense just mm -hmm. in the last week? There's certainly been distribution, but now all of a sudden you start to see a bit of a change, particularly in the short term, which is more, I yes. think, where you're, you're paying attention. Would you, would you say that's a fair assessment? Absolutely. We saw yeah. it through almost all the stocks, uh, especially I think it was the Monday session. Almost everything changed of character. Uh, yeah. We had it through almost all the major big tech stocks. We had it in uh, anything that really was important was 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 happening. So again, we're seeing short lived potentially rally yeah. here. But um, I really liked it this morning. I think this morning had excellent trades on it. Excellent. It's fantastic. Let's talk about gold a little bit. Gold has been one of those charts that I think a lot of people love to not like through much of 2023. <laughs> But yeah. then a huge shift that's happened in October has been mm -hmm. pretty incredible. Now gold, we're talking about a retest of all-time highs. What's happened in the gold space? What do you what do you see in the on the chart here? Yeah, so usually I follow gold a little bit differently to others, and I talk about yields. So mm -hmm. we've got gold. Gold does well in stagflation, questionable whether we're in such an environment. But gold usually actually is the oldest currency, so it prefers actually lower yields. Now, this is different, and this is a situation where you could say it's all to do with the geopolitical situation. I would like to think it's actually due to something we haven't seen in a while, which is a heavy short across all managed funds. So we saw managed funds heavily short at that red arrow down the bottom, and I mean heavily. Then all of a sudden, we see this huge price action move. That usually is consequential of what we call a short squeeze, which most of us are familiar with now, thanks to GameStop, AMC, all of these types of things. <laughs> uh, so this actually marks a very important point. And I couldn't put it on this chart, but we've seen this four times, I think I was mentioning to you at the beginning of the show, over the last like 12 years. And in every time, we've tended to go to a very strong kind of gain for gold in fact i think the average was about 28 percent. we're about six and a bit up from there so it could mark a a massive turn again trend line is the theme of the day we broke through that means that usually pullbacks will be met by some form of buyer and at this stage yeah i could see an all-time high for gold and and you know i think everyone's going to start talking about it but it could be that gold might even go i'm going to make crazy calls and say over the next couple of years i'm, I'm seeing three thousand potentially for something like this Wow. And, and what's funny is I, I think of uh, when you have a target like that, it seems crazy that we could get there. But 
I remember having a similar reaction when people asked me about the 10-year yield. And I said, it could even get to 2.5%, oh, yeah. right? 3%. And now those are <laughs> yeah. quaint numbers back in the rearview mirror somewhere. Exactly. Just to finish yeah. off, Tom, let's talk about crude oil. Energy, of course, one of the you know real, real key themes in 2023. Now you're starting to see a bit of a rotation here. Crude oil has come off in the last week. Do you see further upside mm. here or more of a question mark in your mind? I think it's definitely a question mark for me. Uh, on this chart, we've got a red box up above. That would have been usually an expectation. After the market made this kind of like high, as you saw, like a change of character, um, a high, a low, a high, a high, and then a low, a low. Then it came back to retest this level, and we've seen three red kind of candles since that point. I'm starting to think maybe this is in a swing short or at least chop. Mm. I'm not really heavily you know, going against energy sector per se, but I think that if the economy is asked, going to start weakening, if we see that uninversion of yields, traditionally, that's not been good for the old oil sector. So I'm bullish on some commodities, but not necessarily oil. And I could see this chopping to downside at this stage. So yeah, the, the, look, it's had some excellent trades. Some of the best trades last week were actually short oil at mm. the right levels. Um, so yeah, I am moving towards possible uh, negativity here, or at least neutrality on oil moving forward. Tom, this was awesome. I appreciate so much. It was so great to meet you in person. I'm not surprised that your appearance on the final bar has been pretty successful. Great charts. Thanks for making our ACP platform look very, very good. I appreciate that. And uh, be well, stay safe there in Melbourne. We'll talk to you again soon. It's a great platform, Dave. Thank you very much, everybody. And uh, good luck out there in the markets. That's Tom Atkinson. Tom's the chief uh, technical analyst at FX Evolution coming to us from uh, Melbourne, Australia. And again, thanks so much, Tom, for waking up early and, uh, and being a part of the show. I met Tom at a conference that they, uh, that they held, the FX Evolution, down in Las Vegas a couple weeks ago. We had a great conversation, really thoughtful, uh, great awareness. We often talk about the importance of situational awareness. The moment I started talking with Tom, I was like, this is someone who really has an understanding of what's happening and really thinking about all these moving pieces that we're uh, attempting to go through. I love some of Tom's charts, really just focusing on those key trend lines, uh, because as you probably know from watching the show, I like simple approaches that are easy to understand and easy to implement. And just recognizing that a stock like Apple, that other the charts we talk about, just in a consistent downtrend, get excited when that downtrend is no longer in play, when those trend lines are finally broken. Uh, great take there and, uh, and a brilliant uh, guest appearance by Tom Atkinson of FX Evolution. Folks, we've got to wrap up the show and go to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. You know, I was inspired by seeing utilities and REITs at the top of the leaderboard. I was not inspired uh, in, uh, to optimism by the fact that those are some fairly defensive sectors at the top. But it did make me want to think about returns in the month of October so far and see what's been happening. Here's the S&P 500 kind of in black. You can see that the S&P through the course of October has been positive, negative, kind of flipping back and forth, currently down about 0.9% for the month, starting the clock at the, uh, at the end of September. I'm looking at a couple other sectors on here. And from the top, we have communication services, this same time up 3.2%. In pink, we have the technology sector up 0.8%. In orange, utilities actually managing to outperform the S&P month to date as of today's close. Here in brown is the energy sector. So I would agree with Tom's assessment, that last chart, we're talking about crude oil prices really reversing all of a sudden very quickly energy, which have been some of the strongest charts. If you think about individual stocks showing strength outside of communication services, the alphabet types of charts, energy has been pretty decent, but really maybe starting to change here. I think an important rotation may be happening. Look at the hook higher in communication services and technology, the hook lower in energy, certainly something to continue to monitor. Chart number two, NVIDIA. Again, a lot of earnings last week, this week, the week to come. This is where a lot of uh, mega cap names are reporting. NVIDIA not on the earnings list today, but as I was looking at Alphabet and, uh, and Microsoft reporting after the close, I'm thinking of other mega cap names at key technical sort of uh, uh, junctures or moments. NVIDIA, a head and shoulders top. We talked about the bearish momentum divergence that occurred July, August, September with higher highs in price, lower peaks in momentum. We talked about the lower high in uh, mid-October that created this head and shoulders topping pattern, the neckline. And this week, NVIDIA is actually bouncing off the neckline. So instead of completing that rotation and breaking down like we saw with Las Vegas Sands earlier in the show, for now, this is actually holding the neckline, holding support, an important chart to watch. If we would break below that neckline, that would suggest at least a retest of that 200-day moving average, currently around 345, 346. 
Finally, looking at other asset classes, looking at other markets, always important. I find a lot of times equity investors kind of put the blinders on and they just look at the S&P, the NASDAQ, the futures, Apple, Tesla, whatever stock it is. You have to remember that other asset classes like currencies, commodities, bonds can tell you a lot about the conditions, about risk assessment and uh, risk appetite by institutional investors and elsewhere. I can't help but notice since the end of August, we have seen widening spreads in the high yield market meaning uh, bond investors are requiring additional compensation to take on uh, the debt of risky companies. You're seeing increased volatility, and I've plotted that upside down just to show that increase and how those two things line up with stocks going down. We've talked about the trend in the S&P. I would argue still lower, lower highs, lower lows until proven otherwise. Also note high yield spreads and volatility also trending in that direction that tends to coincide with bearish market phases. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Tom Atkinson joining us from Melbourne, Australia at FX Evolution. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.